Thank everyone for coming and, and being here and spending a little bit of time uh, talking about a topic that for some of us, maybe personally, uh, you're, you're invested personally, some professionally, but it's something that regardless of who we are and what we do, it's something that is now a part of life and that's social media. Um, so before we begin, I want to go ahead and, and just kind of go over what we'll be covering today. Um, this is where I sat for a little bit, uh, for a long time, because I was one of those ones that kicked and screamed and dragged my feet as far as social media was concerned. But when I started looking at this, I thought, well, what is it that, that is important besides just sitting and chatting about it or tweeting about it? What, what can we do with it? So what I'd like to do today is talk about what is social media just kind of giving everybody a little bit of an update and not that I'm saying that you don't know what it is but when I started looking at what social media was I kind of had to take a step back and went wow there's a little bit more to this than what I thought so we'll be talking about the, the platforms the risks um, the advantages and the disadvantages of social media not only on a personal level but also from a client standpoint since we're talking therapy and also from a professional level we're going to look at why it should be taken seriously on a therapeutic level understanding the implications on what can happen in therapy in these relationships and then maybe at the very end looking at some of the approaches that can be taken some some unique approaches of using social media because there's a lot of press out there and there's some really exciting new developments uh, new research that's coming out and I want to share a little bit of that with you now here's the thing social media is very quick very fast this presentation will be very quick, very fast. So it's going to mirror a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. And so there's some videos that we have. So there might be a little bit of a delay in between the PowerPoints. So those of you that are online, you probably, you will see that. You will see going off of the presentation as we move into the videos, which is going to happen right now. So what we have, um, video that's going to be coming up, is just a sh little short. Instead of giving you a lot of information, again, I wanted to embrace social media.
Pretty amazing, isn't it? Some of that statistics. And again, when you look at that, it really brings out the, the point that social media is not just getting on Facebook and doing an update on your status. It is not just doing a little bit of tweet of this is what I had for lunch. Social media has grown into every part of our life. And so when we're looking at social media, it's interesting that there are more devices on earth than there are people. More devices that connect than there are people on earth. That's pretty outstanding. And when you think about it in terms of just numbers of the information people are generating, think about the implications professionally and what it does. So when you're looking at social media landscape itself, and I hope that this is a little bit slow, but what was amazing to me, again, I, I am not, I'm not a social media person. And when I started looking at this, there are different venues for any type of work that you want to do. You can publish on a site, you have virtual worlds, which are gamings, uh, discussing, sharing, publishing. We usually think of like Twitter and the Facebook. Those are what we usually think of social media, but it goes much farther than that. I love this slide because when you look at it, there are ways to figure out what does it mean? What is social media? This is kind of what we look at, but examples for it. So using a, a, Twitter, I'm eating a donut. Facebook, I like donuts. Foursquare, this is where I eat donuts. Instagram, here's a photo, a vintage photo of my uh, donut. YouTube, I'm eating a donut skills. My skills include donut eating. I love that one. Pinterest, here's a donut recipe. Uh, last of them, now I'm listening to donuts and I'm, I'm a Google employee who eats donuts. And so depending on which social media you use will depend on what you're actually kind of looking for. So there are a lot of choices of how you want to use social media. So when you're looking at, okay, so really breaking it down, if you think about it, Twitter is sitting at a cocktail party. Very short little snippets of conversation. Facebook, you're having a family reunion. Everybody wants to get together and find out what everybody else is doing. We're standing at the water cooler for Foursquare. This is where I'm at, this is where I went, this is th those types of things. LinkedIn is the boardroom. So when you're sitting in the boardroom, we're doing professional things. And Pinterest is your bulletin board of, oh, let's just share some things that we really like. So looking at what is social media. Basically, social media are platforms. They're platforms, they're venues where people get together because they have certain interests, activities, backgrounds, uh, relationships they want to cultivate. And when I was looking for a little picture on this one, this is a real common one for a lot of Facebook, right? You get the, the cats that are hanging off the walls and those types of things. Why do we do that? Well, because is it an interest? No, is it an active background? It's fun. And we have to think about it. I recently did a presentation on this only. It was called Safety Relationship, Re Relationship Safety in the Age of Social Media. And, um, when I asked, it was for junior high and high school students, and I said, why are you on these? And the number one reason was because it's fun. And that's why a lot of people get involved in it, but there's so much more to it. So let's look a little bit at the risks and the advantages of using social media. I thought this was really interesting. Uh, so instead of just going to what we usually think of risks and advantages, I looked at job opportunities, and these are the numbers that were pulled out of people that had found jobs through social media. And anybody who is involved in any of these types of social medias know that social networking is really powerful. And when you get your information out there, you can find a lot of information. And so being able to utilize this. So it's really important that not only on a, profession, a personal level, but a professional level, we have some really, really high powered numbered types of advantages. When we talk about relationships, one of the things that, that research has kind of shown is that uh, when, you, when you deal with profiles and, and gender expectations and those types of things is that it actually helps support. It helps support the expectations that we have. Now, I'm going to step aside here for a little bit because we're going to be doing this. It's going to be one of those roller coaster, um, balance type of things is, okay, that's an advantage. Oh, wait, that's a disadvantage. Wait, that's an advantage. Wait, that's a disadvantage. And so as we go through this, and this is great because that's what social media is all about, is that you have so many people giving so many different types of input. And so going back and forth on these, because people will say, well, you don't want gender expectations. That's, that's stereotyping. But yet at the same time, 
because of the profiles, what we'll be talking about a little bit later, is that um, it helps a person in terms of presenting themselves and actually solidifying who they are. What motivates interpersonal communication? Again, the high school, the junior high students that were sitting there uh, saying, oh, I do it because it's fun. And they get on, they tweet with their friends, they Facebook with their friends, they're, they're texting, they're, they're keeping in constant communication. Entertainment, there's, a, we'll talk a little bit more about these, so these are just some highlights. People do it because it's fun. They get on and they have, uh, they have games they watch, they, and then they, they have this community in which they can discuss whatever it was that they watched or what they're doing. Uh, but self-presentation, and that was, that's a huge one because you, when you talk to people about social media, one of the things that they, they mention is, well, you know, people are really putting themselves out there, then they're not really like that. Okay, but yet don't we do that as well in face-to-face? -face? For example, those of you that I know, you see a different face from me here than when we're upstairs visiting or if I'm on the phone with you for my learners. Or for those of you that don't know me, you're going to see me a little bit different than, say, even before when we're taking pictures and, and we're doing those types of things. And, and so when we're talking about presentation is how do you present yourself? And the difference with social media is that you have time in order to sit down and really think about what it is as opposed to coming in and just something spontaneous and there's no filter. At least with social media, there can be some type of a filter. So self-presentation is a great motivator because people can actually think about what is it that I would really like to present myself as to people who are looking at me. So we're going to take a little bit of step here. We're going to look at some of the social media, and we're going to actually talk about phones. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be doing uh, the communication this way. So I, I've selected a couple just to kind of give you an idea. So Foursquare is one of the social medias that actually links to Twitter and to Facebook. And what it does, um, how many of you are familiar with Foursquare in here? OK, we have two. It's three. So those of you that don't know, what you do is it's, it's an app that you can put on there and what you do is you can tell where you are. So when you're at Starbucks across the street and you're getting ready for your daily latte and it's like this line is really slow or I can't believe the person behind me just pushed me or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's a location thing. And what it does is that it uploads it here so people can actually see where you're at. For example, Ashley. So Ashley, when she came in, she's, she's obviously in Vegas here and she, um, Ten hours ago, she, she uh, was at the Imperial Palace. So we're going to kind of track Ashley here just a little bit. But what happened was this is her actual, her actual uh, Foursquare page. So, so put that one aside. Let's look, let's look at Twitter. And again, notice how fast it's going. Social media, that's what it does. Foursquare uh, to twi Twitter. Adam Savage, anybody know Adam Savage from Mythbusters? Okay, uh, what he did was, this is an example, and if you notice, these slides, these next slides, were all taken from, um, from the Army, from the military website. And this is one of, that they used when they talked about, about tweeting. Now, what he did was he tweeted that he was on his way home, and he tweeted a picture. The problem is, is that when you look at this, you notice a lot of information. So anybody who is following Adam not only knows that he's going home, he knows they know where he is, but now they know what his vehicle looks like. And if you look, his vehicle is pretty specific because we have, we have some, um, some stickers here. We see the, where he is in terms of what the environment is, his, his neighborhood and those. So he is given more information than, I'm off work and I'm heading home. And that's really important when we start looking at this is the type of information that you're using and really being very conscious of it. I love this particular this little story here. Um, and this is not the person, it's just a, a really dramatic picture that they used. And so there was a young man who worked for Wire magazine. And one day he was, um, he was at the uh, Golden Gate Park. And while he was at the Golden Gate Park, he saw a young woman who was taking pictures with her, her iPhone. And so he thought he would do just a little bit of an experiment. So he went to, uh, went to his laptop and he pulled up Flickr. 
And he thought, well, what are the chances? And as he started looking at Flickr, what he did was, whenever you take a picture, it gives you a geotag, which we'll talk about in just a second. And what it does is it geotagged the picture. So when it went on, he could actually find on the map where pictures are taking. And so what he did was he looked within the area of the Golden Gate Park and started going through the pictures that were uploaded. And because he had been watching her, he was able to tell, to identify the woman who he was across the park from. He was able to identify her by just seeing that she was taking a picture. Not only that, because he was able to identify her, then he went back and was able to go through her information, the rest of her photos, and he saw pictures of not only her, her friends, her family, her apartment, her bedroom. Now not only did he know who, what she looked like, he knew information about her that we as, as individuals would never put out there. If we knew that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> If we knew that there were total strangers out there looking at our bedrooms, um, I don't know whether we would do that or not. But yet, because he just watched and did a little bit of investigative work, he was able to identify her and find her if he wanted her. So let's talk about what geotagging is. Geotagging is a, a, a code that is automatically embedded in the pictures that you're taking. So whenever you upload any type of picture, people can find you. They can find you, uh, especially with Foursquare. If you remember, Foursquare, Foursquare is automatically connected to your Twitter and your Facebook, unless you turn it off. And so not only are you giving pictures, but now you're telling everybody where you are. Now, here's the interesting thing. When I was doing this presentation before, I had a, uh, I had a woman in, uh, in the group that raised her hand, and she said, um, that's kind of scary. And I said, yeah, it is. And she says, no, you don't understand. I just upgraded my iPhone. And when I got my new iPhone, all my pictures that I've ever taken with my iPhone were on that phone and identifying location information. So when you're out there and you're taking pictures and you're not aware and you're sharing with people that you think are your friends or you're just saying, oh, this is okay. So right now if I put, um, you know, I take a picture and, and I'm posting it, well, people know I'm here because we're virtual. However, at the same time, they could track me. So when I leave here and I'm taking a picture, oh, I just stopped for whatever on my way to, to my relative's house and here's a picture of them, now they can track not only where I was, where I'm going, and when I get there. So let's look at Ashley again. So Ashley, she, uh, she checked into the Imperial Palace, but notice, okay, she went to Dick's Last Resort and then the Cosmopolitan, uh-oh, now she's in the detention center. What kind of information are we getting about Ashley? There's a lot of information that even though we think might be kind of silly, we're progressing. We are actually able to track. So what are the dangers? When you look at those types of things, they establish patterns. Anybody who wants to track you can track you through your pictures. So if you are four squaring at Starbucks, I'm standing in line waiting for my morning latte, and then the next day, oh, guess what? Same time, same order, I'm standing in line again. Next day, oh, it's really warm here. I think I'll have maybe a nice tea instead of a coffee. Guess what? Anybody who wants to track you can find you. We're also talking about things, information that we probably wouldn't think about putting out there. And if you remember going back, would you put a picture of your child, grandchild, niece, nephew on a bulletin board? Anybody can see it. And that's basically what you're doing if you're not aware of what can happen. It, there's also seems to be a loss of control when you're doing this because now you have people that are coming up and saying, I, I don't know whether anybody's ever experienced this, oh, I saw your post, and it's like, what post? And you have people that will post, or if you send them a picture, and then they will resend the picture, and they'll resend a picture. And so now we're not even in control of the type of information that we send. So right now, if you are not familiar, if you have your iPhone, or if you have your, your phone, I'm gonna show you the function that you can use because when your phone is on, if you do not turn your GPS off 
anybody could find you if they knew how to do it. So what I do is, unless I'm traveling, I take it off because I don't necessarily, I live in a little community. And so I don't need people being able to track me at all times. I don't need somebody who maybe have a grudge against me or someone who wants to be really friendly to be able to know exactly where I am. So when you get your phone, go to your settings. And there should be um, a place on there that says location. Let's see, mine says location access. And then notice down, it says GPS satellite. Mine says GPS satellite and access to my information. Mine says on. But again, I'm traveling. And so because I'm traveling and having to drive, drive freeways that I'm not used to, I want people to be able to find me if I get lost. So mine is on, but I usually keep that off. So what you would do is if you don't want people to have that information, you just turn it off. Now here's the thing. Some smartphones, some iPhones, the, the iPhones do it, I know for sure what people have told me is, if you don't check it periodically, it will turn itself back on. So you need to go in every once in a while, just make sure it's on. And you know what, these are on, and, and really truly it can be a safety fact factor. Because if, if you need people to be able to find you, it's there. But if you don't need it, why have it on? So just a little bit of, of information there for you. So it does go a little bit, a little bit further. Um, we're going to take it one step further, this next little video that, that we have. School tegen Antwerpen. Ja. Insecten. Dat blief. Ik voel twee insecten op je, op je rug. Kan dat? Ja, vlinders. Slovenië, Slovenië. Zo, hè. Eén moto, oranje. Pas erop. Zenit. Oui, oui, bien. Je hebt een vriendin, uh, Julie de b***. <laughs> ja. Een boeiend liefdesleven. <laughs> Drie, vier zelfs. Die vierde, daar zwijg ik meestal over, dus dat weten niet veel mensen. Hoe is mijn spierscheur? <laughs> Maison rouge, balcon, blanc. Yeah. Ik zie geld, ik zie uh, transacties. Maar kent je rekeningnummer van buiten? Ik denk dat ik het wel weet. Je staat wel negatief op je bankrekening. Ja? Yeah. 9, 7. Last month, mm -hmm. you spent 200 euros on alcohol. No. Vorige maand... 300 euro aan kleding gespendeerd. 8, 5, ja. voor een huis dat van eigenaar gaat veranderen. 795.000 euro. Ja, maar eigenlijk. 41. Ja. Is dat juist? Ja, dat is juist. Oh my god. Oh nee. Ah, dat is vind je eng. How many, yeah, that's exactly, how, how many of you went, wow. So when you look at this and you kind of go, wow, that wow factor, let me share a little bit something with you because we're talking about not only personal safety, we're talking about professional safety, we're talking about your client safety. And information that you put out there, you don't necessarily know. And, and so it's not to scare you. When I was talking to the junior high and high school students, I scared them. Um, but this is more of a vigilant type of thing because this was, I am not, again, I'm going to keep stressing, I'm not a social media person. I don't have a lot of information on there. However, the accessibility is, is there for somebody who knows it. 
this summer I went to use my my business card I took uh, had got coffee and I used my business card and they said I'm sorry you can't use it. the machines like going off and it's like ah, rah, you know all these things I was waiting for it to blow up and I went what's going on I thought oh okay maybe something's matter with the the strip you know on my card so I said okay so I got my coffee and a little bit later I had to go and make a deposit. So went to make a deposit, put my, my card in and it started the same thing, all these error messages and things going off and bells and whistles and I'm going, what's going on? So I take my card in and I said, I don't know what's going on with this, please fix it, I need it, it's my business card. So she tried it, same thing. And she said, I can't help you. You're gonna have to call the corporate office and I'm going, what in the world happened? took it home, got on the phone with my bank, with the corporate offices, and I said, listen, this is what's going on. And they said, okay, 20 minutes later after they had verified everything but what I had eaten, you know, three days ago for lunch, and they identified it was me, they said, well, by the way, did you make this purchase? And I said, to this person, I said, I don't know who that is. What, how much was it? And they said, $900. And they said, what about this one? I said, uh, no, how much was that one? And they said 700. Now I use my business card only for business. I'm not on the internet doing those types of things, using it, I'm not, you know, it's, it's for business. The thing is, is that I do have a website. Um, I did have a Facebook for, for my business. I have a Facebook page, but for some reason, somehow, whoever figured it out, they were able to tap into my business account. Now, luckily, they didn't let those purchases go through. But I was a victim of something like that, and I am very, very careful because I'm scared to death of it. Well, plus the fact that I don't have time, I did that number two. But it was, it was just amazing to me that somebody could find me and tap into my account. And I actually had to go for a credit protection thing because I didn't know. I didn't know how they got it, who had it, whatever it was. And I finally said, so where exactly did this take place? And they said, Thailand. So somewhere not even close to where I was or places that I've been, they had my number. It's not just for our safety, though. When we talk about clients, we talk about the people we work with, we are actually finding these types of things that are going on. Not only things that they bring in, but they are changing the face of how people interact with each other. We have a new generation coming up that they cut their teeth on the keyboards. In fact, I saw a little cartoon that it had a baby and oh look, they have an extra thumb so that they could type on their keyboard. <laughs> it changes how we learn rewiring our brain, and it gives us ferret attention, which I say all the time. I have that fact, that's the first thing I tell my clients. Oh, excuse me, I have ferret attention, you just need to know that. Um, and a lot of it is because of the society that we're living in. Importantly, when we look at this, or this is the interesting thing, is that when you look at social media, social media has a strong connection to social psychology. And you look at the tenets of social psychology, especially the, the, the three main areas of our thinking, our influence, and our relationships, everything within social psychology falls into social media or vice versa. So for example, and notice that the, what I have under here is what we talk about groups with social, social psychology. And when everybody's under here, you have to kind of do what everybody else is doing or you're gonna get tripped up. And so we kind of go along with the flow. But because of this, it changes the way that we think, it changes the, who influences us and where they come from, as well as the relationships that we build. Now, as, as Dr. Grimes mentioned, the work that is coming out with, with neuroscience and Dr. Siegel's uh, important work with brains and, and the functioning of it, and we know way back from social psychology that social relationships are the cornerstone of well-being for people. We are social animals. That's what we, that's what we do, is that we create connections, we create relationships. And so the idea of social media, when you think about it, it kind of fits right into it because people are building relationships. Now, there's no judgment here. 
And that's one of the things that I'd like you to kind of keep in mind because remember I said we're going to go back and forth on this? So there is no judgment whether it's right or wrong. We're talking about the fact that from social psychology, we are social animals. We are looking for ways to build relationships. Wow, social media is a way to build a relationship. So therefore, using logic, what we have is we have social media and relationships is a good match. I thought that this was really interesting at the Evolution of Psychology, uh, Psychotherapy Conference. We had Dr. Hallen says, when people are afraid to do as they please, they follow everyone else. So just as while we're getting this one up and going, how many of you in here are, have any kind of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest? Okay, for those of you at home, you can raise your hand as well, but I think everybody in here raised their hands. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is um, how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I love that video. And you know what? And I saw you back there. For those of you in, in video land, what happened was we have people in the back that it wasn't until the second and third person, then they're going like this. I saw you, I saw you. But it was, wasn't it, when, when you had more people, it's like, okay, the music's going and everybody's kind of rocking and rolling. And we, didn't you just kind of want to get up and dance with them? And when you first looked at the guy doing his thing, it was kind of like, oh, well, he's kind of a nut. You know, wow, look at how weird he's dancing. But when people started following in, there was that momentum. That's what happens with social media. That's why things take off. Is you get that one person who gets out there and they kind of go, mm, I'm not kind of, I'm not kind of sure about this. I'm not don't know where this is going to go, but you get two or three, and after you get the third person, boom, there it is. Those of you that are on Facebook, if you've ever noticed, if you posted something or someone posted something and nobody answers, it just goes, it just stays there. But if you have one, you have two people answer, look at the thread. Look at the thread of people that are going in and answering, or even likes. 
If somebody likes something, they don't want to be the own like, then it's okay, they liked it, so guess what, I can do it now. And so it's the social momentum of what we're looking at of social media and why it's so important. And this is really important when you talk about relationships, is because when people are looking at those things, I mean, we were having, I saw, like I said, I saw everybody doing this. They were like, yeah, they were having a good time. And when you have a good time and your buddies start, those little guys, those endorphins are going, ooh, party, let's have a party. And they're not having a good time. Everybody else is infectious. And so our relationships build. But when our relationships build and we have people that are doing things that we like and they're having fun with us, it increases how we view ourselves. And they've done studies that say that self-esteem actually increases when people update their profiles. Now think about this, therapeutically, what does that do? How can we utilize those types of things in the therapy, which we will be talking about just a little bit later. When we look at the, now, Lots of studies, again, you have the pros, you have the cons, and you have those people that are sitting there going, social media is destroying everything we have. And then you have people over here, social media is great, it's keeping people who aren't connected, connected. You have both of them. So there's some discernment here in what you use with the information. So yes, we can look at relationships, but they're finding what's interesting is that when people have online relationships, studies have shown that those relationships are stronger offline, face to face. So if you have a Facebook buddy and you get to have coffee with them, your relationship builds stronger because of that. This is a big one for therapy, especially for marriage and family therapists, because there's a lot of things with where are people meeting their mates and how are they meeting them and oh my goodness, it's taking away from the face interaction and everything. I just read something last night that noted that people do not make a determination whether they like or dislike a person until 20 minutes after they talk to them. So regardless of whether you're meeting face to face or online, you still have to have that 20 minute interaction before you realize whether you like them or not. It just so happens that with online, with online relationships when you meet somebody is that you get all the stuff out of the way firsthand. So you can determine whether you wanna spend time to go out and meet that person or you wanna take that time out to do those types of things. But when you look at the statistics of online dating and relationships, they're pretty positive and they're pretty powerful. What I really like is that, um, let's see, do I have it on here? That the number of, uh, that the number of relationships that stay after two years is significantly larger if a person meets online. So yeah, we have the very beginning of, well, you know, you're, you're, people are, are putting themselves out there of something that they're not. And that's true. But my argument is don't we do that face to face as well? How many times have we met someone and then after getting to know them, we go, wow, they're not even close to what I thought they were. And so what's happening is just the perspective we're taking and where we're going through this. Point two, in our society now, we have Natives of technology. This is the generation, I am not a native of technology. Again, I was kicking and screaming. Okay, so I've been dying to tell this, and our tech people are back there going, yep, that's right, she doesn't know about technology. My computer's upstairs right now as they're trying to look at it because I did something. They know, when I have to do a loop, uh, learn a new program or do, not research, but programs or those apps and things, I don't spend the time trying to figure it out to myself. I go to my kids. And now my grandkids who are in grade school. I, yeah, that's the scary thing. I haven't gone there yet, but I know the time will be there. But these are, these are the people that, that, that are coming up. So going to my little story is, um, I do have a friend, virtually she said she was going to be, she, to be uh, logging in and, and hopefully she's with us. But, but Miss Pamela is a colleague and, and she came to me about a year ago, and she said, um, I really want to do this presentation at the wellness conference in Casper, uh, and I want to know if you want to do it. Now, I'm all about having a captive audience, so anytime I get a chance to speak to someone, it's like, yeah. And I said, what's the topic? And she went, social media, and I went, you yeah, know. 
And she goes, it's safety relationship. I said, okay, I can deal with that. So safety relationship in the age of social media. And this particular presentation has morphed out of that. So thank you to Pamela for helping me to, to take a better look at this. But I am not a native of technology. Um, and the thing is, is that doing the research and those types of things is that I found myself in the pitfalls of everything that I've been reading. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, so let's see. This is TechSees. This is actually a conversation. Figure it out. Can anybody figure it out? Anybody tech people? Hey, before I tell you what the sentence says, here's the thing is that this right here, a text dictionary. Oops, hold on. Somebody was trying to contact me is that there are actually publications of dictionaries that you can get so that you can communicate with people. Um, so a little personal, when I started getting involved with social media and texting, because I didn't even text for a longest time, I was like, I can't do this. When my husband and I, we started, he would LOL all over the place. And I thought, oh, how sweet. And I finally said, thank you so much, but you really don't need to say lots of love after everyone, or la laughing out loud. He goes, oh, I thought you meant lots of love. So every text that he would do, and, and the reason that came up was because we had a friend that did LOL, and he goes, that's just kind of strange that he would say oh, lots of love to me. So it is a new language. Okay, so this particular one was away from keyboard for 10, but Back at keyboard, laugh out loud. Guess who is asleep at keyboard? Oh, be right back. Back at keyboard, by the way, boss watching now, later. This is the communication. This is what, these are what kids are learning. They are learning to be very short in what they're doing. Everybody's kind of going, yeah, okay, that makes sense, I got it. These are the types of things that we are looking at a society that is moving into this. And here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that you can do what I did for years, dragging your feet, kicking and screaming, going, I'm not going to do it. But it doesn't matter what you do or don't do, it's happening. It's not going to go away. So those people that are coming in with online types of situations, whether it's good or bad, whether they found the love of their life or they found out that their husband or wife was cheating on them, it's not going to go away. You can't just say stop doing it because it's not going to go away. It is a reality of something that we are having to face and we are seeing it not only in everyday life but in our offices. The question is, are we draining our brains? Are we losing what we have because we have so much technology? And now this part of our brain is just, mm, we're just going to chop it off and there it is. It's just connected there and we'll let, we'll let the electronic vices do our thinking for us. The ferret attention has to do kind of with this on what is happening with rewiring our brains. So a little bit of positive and negative. The negative is, okay, we have a lot of information. That is causing us not to pay attention. We don't pay attention because what we do is we get this little piece of information and we jump. And one video I was looking for, it was a commercial. I don't know whether you remember it where uh, the person asked the question of the mother or father and they said, what is this? And then they started doing the web search type of thing that they said this and then they went off to this and they went through this whole litany of different topics. Does anybody remember that commercial? It was just the brain load of, of one to the other to the other to, and we do that. If we want something, what do we do? We can go to the internet, we can find, and that's not social media, but how many of us, I'm gonna say me, because I've done it, wasn't sure of something, so what did I do? I needed a quick answer. I posted on Facebook. What's your opinion on this? Or this is really cool, what do you think? Or I need to do this or something. And we're getting information all the time. So the good and the bad news on that. The good news is, is that we are getting a lot of information. The other is, well, guess what? It's causing problems because we're not focusing. And one of the things that 
people are finding that with a lot of social media usage is that it mimics the addictions of other things, of other substances. Now, why is that happening? Well, because what happens is when we get pleasure from something is that we get a rush of dopamine. And when we get a rush of dopamine, we go, wow, that feels really good. Guess what? I'm going to do it again. Wow, that felt even great. Guess what? I'm going to do it again. That's where we get, I mean, there's a whole, being really simplistic. But when we're talking about that, we're talking about people getting the instant gratification, which again seems to, that's another one of the, the things that they talk about. You know, one of the arguments is, well, we're, we're building a society of, of instant gratification. Right or wrong, ladies and gentlemen, it's happening. We can't stop it. We have this generation coming up. This, these natives of technology, they're getting instant gratification. But what's happening is when you have that chemical release and when you have those things that people are going, I want to feel that way again. We hear about those people that are hooked on Facebook. They're checking their Facebook all the time. Why? Because they're getting a chemical rush from it, just like any other addiction. Now, do you have to be really over here to get that? Oh, another story, because I'm full of them because I fell into this. When I had my professional page on Facebook, I had one for defining moments, and what I would do is I would, I would uh, post topics. Because somewhere along the line, I attended a conference that said, you know what, if you want to build your business, social media is the way to do it. And I went, uh, okay. So I took it and I had to do homework and I had to do this. It caused so much anxiety. Not only because what do I have to post, but then afterwards, what I was doing was I was spending so much time going back to see if somebody commented on what I said because it was brilliant. I was posting brilliant things all over the place. It's like, that is the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. Somebody needs to comment on that. Okay, let's see who did it. No one. <laughs> okay, maybe they just didn't read it. And do it again. And do it again. And when they did, it was like, woohoo, okay, now I need to post something even more brilliant. Now I gotta find a graphic that's just really gonna get them. And you get into this thing of, and it's easy. It's easy to get into that. So, talked a little bit about those types of things. So, things that'll show up in the therapy room is you people that are gonna have compulsive, obsessive type of things, behaviors like me, it's like I can't get off my Facebook. But you're gonna have things that deal with relationships. Uh, you're going to have different genders, you're going to have different age groups where people are walking in and if you are paying attention to what's going on, you can look asking the right questions to find out maybe if there is a hook here that maybe you can use. This is just a really benign little example of what may show up. So. OMG, J Justin proposed, maybe not the way I wanted him to, he did it over text, but who cares, we're getting married, congratulations, don't forget to save me, to send me your save date, don't worry, I won't, OMG, I'm so excited, it was so unexpected, Justin says, Carolyn, what are you talking about? Carolyn says, what are you talking about, silly, you sent me a text this morning saying you want to spend the rest of your life with me, marry me, baby, I know we're young, but we can do it, smiley face, Justin says, that wasn't me. Sarah says, oh damn, shit hits throw down. And Justin says, I lost my phone. Okay, that's maybe, may not end up having someone in there, but if you have someone that's kind of on the verge of depression or anxiety, anyway, and they have something like this happen, guess what, they're gonna walk through your door. Because this has sent them into a tailspin. But there's also some things that technology is doing that's gonna show up in our therapy rooms that maybe you didn't think about. One of the things is that by using anything that is electronic, a computer, a cell phone, an iPad, a Kindle, whatever it is, the blue light on it actually disrupts the production of melatonin. Melatonin is what helps you sleep. Guess what? If you don't have melatonin, it messes up your circadian rhythm. How many of you out there as well as here, have clients that say, I can't sleep, I have insomnia all the time. Check and see what they're doing before they go to bed. 
the blue light disrupts. Now, if we don't know this, we're asking questions like, well, what kind of stresses did you have during the day? How are your relationships going? You know, what's, what's your diet like? We don't think to ask, are you posting on Facebook before you go to bed? How much time are you spending on the computer? Because you know what? And I actually have a friend who has, who has incredible insomnia. And when I said, you know what? You need to put the iPad down before you go to bed. She tried it. She slept. And then she went back to it. She goes, now I can't sleep. Okay, so she's got the addictive of being on it all the time. But still, at the same time, you know, when people are coming in for things, we are not realizing all the implications of what social media can do for us or technology, in this case technology, but it's kind of paired to social media because people are mostly on doing their social media stuff, to what is happening within the body. All right, so I know we have one gentleman here who is interested in this topic. We're talking about cyberbullying. I am not going to bring out all the statistics because you know it's there. To say that, oh, they're cyberbullying, and someone go, what? I didn't know that existed. That's, that's not going to happen. We know that it's there. But we know that there is a pervasive problem of cyberbullying at all ages. And we know that something needs to be done with it. Huge, huge implication from social media. However, it's not just when we look at, at um, cyberbullying is the thing that is harming people. You look at the fact that with social media, that everything is documented online. That tragedy follows. And one of the things that happens, just like your smartphone with your geotag, once you put it out there, even though you delete it, somebody can still find it. If they are tech savvy enough, they could go in and they could look at it. To illustrate this, very sad situation. Again, not a lot of commentary, just thinking about the whole situation. How many of you are uh, familiar with the Steubenville rape case? Okay, just a couple of you. Um, in 2012, a young woman in Steubenville, Ohio, uh, went to a party and she got very drunk. Uh, she passed out. Again, we're not going to talk about the alcohol rights and wrongs of that, just the facts. And in that case, what happened was two of the young men, in this case, because it was well documented, they were football players, which really does kind of move into, into the story itself. Um, they dragged her from house to house and they assaulted her. During that time, people that were around watching were tweeting, were Facebooking, were texting about the incident. Song of the Night is definitely Rape Me by Nirvana. Taking pictures of what she looked like. RIP to the person that died. You went out doing it big. Um, you are with me, not the dead body. There's a dead body in the bill, and people don't care. These were tweets. Now, why is this important? The reason that this is important is because what happened was all of these tweets that were going on by kids who were there at this party. Somebody kind of woke up a little bit and said, you know what, maybe this isn't right. Remember we talked about social psychology? Okay, we've got a little bit of social contagion going on here where one person does it, and when one person does it, another person does it, another person does it. And what happens is people, they don't feel responsible for things. And because they don't feel responsible for it and they can do it anonymously, then they do it more. Well, somebody stood up and said, you know what, this isn't right. So people, they started deleting everything. Well, just before everything was deleted, there was an adult who caught hold of one of the tweets and started doing a screen capture of everything that she read. She was able to go through and find everything. She reported it to the police. Now, everything was gone except her screensaver. So when they got all the information, all the, all the devices, they couldn't find anything just by looking at it, but they were able to go back and they were able to ge find the geotag, they were able to do all of that and figure out who was involved and everything that went with it. Now, here's what happened with it. It wasn't at this level because it, if it wasn't for social media, this young woman who did not remember what happened thought that something happened the next morning when she woke up, but wasn't sure. Wouldn't it, would never have known. And because of that, these two young men 
were prosecuted. They were 17 and they are now serving prison times. Goes a step further. During that time, what happened was there was a group of, of hackers. They were called Anonymous. That was their name. And their pictures are of them with, with, with masks. Nobody ever saw their face that went in and hacked all of this, these accounts, got the information to prosecute these young men. Because of that, now we have a social media war between the two groups. We have the group for, these young, for this young woman who's saying, that's not right, you need to do something, you need to prosecute, fullest extent of the law. And then you have those, well, they were just kids, she was drunk. And you had all of this going on. And she was not the only one, there was another case that it was the same type of thing, it was a social media. The outcome on both of them were that families from both sides received death threats and several of them had to move completely out of the community because of the social media barrage that took place of it. Here's the really, really disturbing thing. This picture right here, okay, this incident happened in 2012. I found this on the Google Gallery. That means that this young woman, no matter how old, no matter how far she puts it behind her, it is still documented. Talk about TTSD. Everything that's documented, those are the people that are going to be walking in. Those are the people that you're going to be seeing. If you're not paying, to, paying attention to social media and how they are affected with it, you are missing a huge, huge part of therapy. This young woman, she was 13, same thing happened. Instead of the support, which you would think for rape victims, tweets like this one, even if it was all his fault, what was a 13-year-old girl doing or hanging around with 18-year-old guys? Same type of thing. Her mother, she said she wanted to, to take it to the, uh, to the authorities. Her mother backed her. They ended up moving. In fact, they moved out of state because of the social media attacks that were taking place. So you take back, back to cyberbullying, there you go. We've got a huge vicious cycle. But it's not just the victims who are walking in. These young ladies rape as well. One, there was alcohol involved, one there was not. They were documented through social media. Both hung themselves at the age of 17. Not because of the rape from what their mothers said, this mother of this young lady. Not because of the rape, because she was getting therapy. It was because of what was happening to her through social media. We need to look at our responsibility of getting all the information that we need to. We are in the society, whether we are doing it or not, we are still being affected. So what's wrong with technology and social media? Well, again, if you look at social psychology, it's at its best. We have false consensus, we have group polarization, we have people that are making decisions based on one person's idea. We have everybody that's joining the bandwagon, woohoo, let's go ahead and do it. Just like we were having fun dancing with the guy on the video. We're also having people that are doing the cyberbullying of those people that watched the young girl in Steubenville who knew better than they said that. It was documented. I knew I should have stopped it, but they didn't. Why does cyberbullying go on? Why does bullying go on? Because it is a social psychological phenomenon. You get a group of people. You get one group of people. You get a leader. They follow the leader. There is no responsibility. If you can be anonymous about it, it's even, even more powerful because then nobody's going to know who you are and you follow. So when you look at social psychology, social media, they're right hand in hand. So those of you that are in virtual land, that are in the social psychology class, pay attention to this one because social media is a huge component. One of the things that we've, I've mentioned all the rest of them before, 
about following uh, you know your ideas of what somebody else has said and following the group and and not having uh, not a sense of self being anonymous the contagion part but one of the things that I haven't mentioned is priming priming is where you set something up so that it's, it's priming for the way a person thinks or acts further down the line the line so what I've been doing for you except for every once in a while throwing in a positive is that I've been priming you to think, what about social media? Is it good or is it bad? It's bad, right? I've been priming you. And so each and every slide you're going, yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it's bad, right? Ah, this serious stuff, serious stuff. And that's what happens. That's a prime example, prime, prime example of what happens with it. It goes beyond just what we do as a person. So because we are in business, because we use social media, because we're using websites and things, I thought it would be kind of fun to take a little bit of look at how this may affect us in terms of social psychology. So the next few slides are actual websites that I found, counseling websites. And I have highlighted and read the things that I want you to pay attention to. So I'll give you a few minutes. Stop suffering now. Impossible to live the life you truly deserve. Depression increasing at alarming rates. Depression is the leading cause of disability and the woman who looks so distraught. Life isn't always easy. Feel lost and hopeless, lacking value to themselves or others, feeling that living is not worth living. What's the point? It's overwhelming. If you're 65 or older, you have a higher risk of experiencing a mood decrease, loss of control over our lives, or increased illness and weakness that accompanies the aging process, triggers severe loneliness. Many carry a deep depression in their hearts. They commit suicide. Oh my gosh! I'm so depressed reading this, but you said everything that I'm feeling. So I walk into your office because you have this on my, your website, because I know you know exactly how I feel. But in the process of priming, what have I done? I told you that life isn't always going to be easy, that it's hard, that if you, these are the things. You come in thinking these things, guess what? If you're thinking these things and I've already said them, what are your chances of getting better, of moving to a higher level, of increasing your well-being? Right? I've primed you. Social media does that. Couldn't you say that life seems to be always not easy and then give the uh, solution that it can be, get better? People online can't. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering, it says, you know, couldn't you just rephrase that same statement and say, Life doesn't always seem easy, and then just add a positive, but it could get better, or it does get better, or it, there's a possibility. So could you still almost say that same statement and just add an adjunct to it that turns it positive, like you said? So sure. coming into the, the counseling session then wouldn't be uh, limiting just to that, the negative. Sure, there's lots of ways that you can do that, but, but the idea, and thank you for the question, because what it illustrates is that when you write something, it's being very conscious of what it is and the implications that you have with it. And so you can put something in there, but if you have people that are talking with positive psychology, why even say that it's, it's not easy? Why can't you say that, you know, maybe, maybe when we're going through life, that we can be at a better spot? Being at a better spot is a lot different than saying life isn't easy. And so it's being very conscious. And that's the point of, and we talked about with people that are doing their self-presentation and being very careful with what they write. As professionals, shouldn't we always, shouldn't we do, be doing the same thing as presenting ourselves and what we want people to think? We don't want doom and gloom. I don't want to associate with doom and gloom. But, think, but what happens is when people are reading this, they're going, you know exactly how I feel because that's how they're feeling. But if I know that you're feeling that way and I'm going to go, oh, you just feel really bad, don't you, all the time? Yes. Your chances are not going to be, well, you know what, let's kick it into high gear. And if you've ever been with someone who walks in and they're doing this and you have someone that goes, hey, how's it going? <laughs> doing the dance guy thing. Get those endorphins moving. Get a change in perspective. It changes. Here's another one. I love this one. Oh, the other one is, uh, more couples marrying today have a 50% chance of getting divorced. 
Wow, why even bother? A 50-50 chance I'll just live with him because I don't have to get divorced. You remain unhappy and unfulfilled for years. Oh my God, it's so sad. Economic problems, medical problems, spiritual problems, mental health problems. These are websites from professionals. And think about it. We do that, don't we? Because we want them to know we know how they feel. But what are we doing to them? What are we doing to people that are reading this? We're setting them up already, right? Hopeless. Hopeless. But because they think we know what it feels like, that we can help them with what they're doing, they come in and see us and then we sit there and go, well, I don't, can't, I don't understand how can we can't change your perception. I love this one. Imagine how much happier your, your relationship would be today if you had been treated by a highly skilled and compassionate couple counselors a year ago. <laughs> Actual website. I love that one. Learn to suffer in silence, then worse, and struggle to maintain their psychological balance. There we go again. If I, if you are, are you competent? Yes. You just didn't see the right person. I'm it. But I'm still going to tell you you're suffering. Suffer. We need to pay attention to what we're doing with our social media as well as professionals. So I want you to think of that. And as you look at this, remember this slide? How many of you saw it going this way? Everything going into it? What would happen if you change your perspective and saw it going this way? Instead of social media being the drainer of who we are, it can now become something that fills us. It's now something where that rewiring, because we talked about rewiring, we talked about dopamine, but here's the reality. Anything that you do can rewire your brain. Anytime you have an experience, guess what? Those little neurons are firing. And if it's a new experience, oh, we're building something different, right? So when we say that social media is rewiring our brains, yes. But so is going to the beach for the first time. So is flying on the airplane. So is having a cup of tea we've never had before, which I stole that little, little analogy from, uh, from something that I read. But it's true. Every time we have an experience, we're rewiring, right? It may not be to the extent of what we're talking necessarily neuroscience-wise with, with uh, traumatic brain injuries, TBIs, and PST, PTSD, and those types of things. But we are still rewiring our brains. And let's face it. If we use it correctly, if we're looking at social media the way we should be doing it, there's a lot of advantages. So let's talk about what's right with technology. This was fascinating to me. There is a magazine, for those of you, there's a journal out there called Cyber Psychology. This was their last issue where they started talking about hu human computer interaction field. This is a brand new field where they are looking at how can technology social media actually be used therapeutically because you know what somebody actually saw the connection wait a second social psychology wait a second positive psychology what happens if we put them together and we use technology in the mix and what they're finding is some amazing things the goal with positive technology is looking at the happiness level the well-being the psychological well-being of a person so it's not just going out there and posting. There actually is some, some logic behind all of these platforms that are being developed. This is being guided, guided by positive psychology. Again, you, may, you don't have to be technologically savvy to do this. You don't have to be on Facebook, but you should know about it. And if you know about social psychology and you know about positive psychology, Here's the next step. We are looking at, okay, look at this. This is actually from the journal. Effective, quality, self-actualization, engagement, and connectedness. Oh, what does that sound like? Hmm, sounds like positive psychology, doesn't it? It sounds like a little bit of Maslow about reaching that hierarchy. It sounds like all of the things that we've been talking about and all the theories. As academians, it is not 
our goal to sit and just be spoon fed the information. It is our job. The reason that you are here, that you are taking classes or you are in this field is because you have the ability to make the connections, to make something that is here to make it stronger. This is one of the areas. Taking something that like social media that people are going, oh, it's ruining our community, it's ruining our society, and go, you know what? It may be if it goes that way, but I can do something about it. I can support this. I can see about this. I can help you with that because I know. And when you have something like social media, the information is there. And even though we get on and we do that, OK, I'm going to read this article. Those of you that are doing research, reading this article. Oh, wait a second. There's another article that they mentioned. I'm going to read that one. OK, and I'm going to read this one. Wait, that's kind of really amazing. And we're doing that ferret thing. We still have the capabilities. And something that I read that was, I thought that was really, really poignant was they said, you know the difference between having something in a book and then doing something with social media or the technology is the idea that if you have a book, you have one person's perspective, one person's way of looking at it. You have social media, you have those connections, and you have multiple ways. You have multiple perspectives of being able to, to see something. So instead of standing on the box like me going, no, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it, looking at it. Now, you don't have to spend all that time. You don't have to give that place of, i got to check my Facebook. I, I had a wonderful video, but we didn't have time, so I wasn't put it on there. But um, this little musical of people are going crazy. i got to check my Facebook. i gotta, I got to creep up on my, on my friends and doing all this stuff. And that's what we think about. But there's so much more to it that we can be looking at. It's called positive computing. The study and development, and this is, this is from the journal, study and development of information and communication technology that is consciously, key word, consciously designed to support people's psychological flourishing in a way that honors individuals and communities' different ideas about the good life. Why not take social psychology? We talk about bullying. We can stop a bully. But if you look at social psychology, it has nothing to do with that. Yes, they are the, they are the, the one that's going through. They're, they're doing the harm. And then you have the victim that is also the one that, who is suffering from it. But take a step back. You get the group. You get them to change their perspective and say no, not the individual. You get that third person of the dancing guy. You've got a movement. It's a change of perspective of using what we have. Po positive technology. The scientific approach, again, improving what we can by the use of what we already have and is not going to go away. As much as we sit and we whine of how it is ruining whatever it is that we're doing in our lives, we need to say, you know what, we can do something with this. So, what will we get with positive technology? Personal experiences, wellness, uh, strengths, increased resilience on all levels. Doesn't that sound very therapeutic? Isn't that what we're trying to do in therapy? Aren't we in trying to increase all of these things? Studies are showing now that if we are conscious, especially, and those, those, anybody that's out there that is doing programming, wow, we need to talk because it's huge. There's two, two, uh, Sites right now that, that are very important in terms of, of utilizing this. One of them you've heard, there's a lot of, a lot of commercials on uh, luminosity, increasing brain function, using the positives of it. There's also one that is called PosiPost, and that's in one of the other slides. PosiPost is a platform where you are not allowed to put anything negative. They give you a sentence at the beginning of the day, you post on it, today I feel, might be it, but you can't put negative. You are not allowed. Today I feel tired. Me, sorry. Try again. You have to do something positive. And we know that if we think positive and we move into that, it changes the attitude of how we are feeling.
And then you can post on other people's positive. Now think of a community of people posing positive things, well-being, and other people going, you know what, I feel the same way. And this is what happened. And you're going, that is awesome. What kind of community are we building? This right here, when you're talking about social media, and you're talking about positive technology, talking positive psychology, there's PERMA right there. This is exactly what they are saying. This is what is happening or can happen with social media. Positive emotions, engagement. Is, isn't that why people are on Facebook and social medias? To engage with other people? Relationships, oh, there you go. We're looking at relationships. Meaning, got to give a meaning to life. Accomplishment, we're posting our accomplishments and achievements all the time. This is positive psychology, ladies and gentlemen. This is social media. Why can't we use them together? Why can't we teach to use them together? Now you've got over here, we've got all these, all these things that we can look at positive wise. It is an avenue for, for individual change, for group change, societal change. I'm working with a client right now who after uh, 37 years of working in one job, um, living by herself, never been married. Uh, she had health problems, now has to live with family. Uh, so she has no social interactions. And before she had her health problems, her niece got her started on Facebook. My therapy with her is to post. You know why? She has to think about something positive. That's her goal, that's her homework. Think about something positive. Well, I don't have anything. Yes, you do. That therapy right there, of what even to post on Facebook? is good therapy. Let's talk about something that's good. What'd you do today? Or what'd you do yesterday? Well, I had a new puzzle. Well, tell me about the puzzle. Well, it was awesome because they have this great. Really? Tell someone. Put it on there. Doesn't matter whether somebody does or not. But you know what? If you're thinking about it and you're doing it, boom, in that study again, when people are updating their profiles with something positive, it increases. And they did this with electrodes. So we've got the data. It increases their self-esteem. So how are we going to do this? Questions you should be asking. First of all, you should be asking, are they online? Are your clients online? And if they are, what are they doing? What medias are they using? Um, what do they post? When do they post? How do they post? Who are they posting with? Who are they hanging out with online? Find out this information. And especially if you're working with teens and adolescents, preteens or tweeners, uh-huh, this is their life. You should be finding out. doesn't mean that you have to stalk them or if they're writing something that is inappropriate. That's not the point. The point is what are they doing socially? What are they, how are you building PERMA with them? How are you building engagement? How are you building accomplishments? How are you doing those types of things? This is information that's important with these generations that are coming up. Again, you know, the, the whole thing got involved. I, I didn't do online dating because it came after my second marriage, although you know what, I probably would have if I'd had that chance because to me it made sense as a really busy professional. I don't want to be doing the bar scene. Where else am I going to meet someone in the grocery store? No, because I'm too busy doing grocery shopping. You know, I'm not going to get all dressed up to, you know, there's all of those arguments of what we're doing. But that generation coming up is the one that we really need to focus on. But there are those of us that are doing this and they're like me. They're going, I don't know how to do this. And I'm getting anxious about it. But yet it can be very, very powerful. So when you look at some specifics, I thought this was really interesting because the words used between adults and teens are different. Speak the language, figure out. So although we may say, you know what? That's not appropriate or you shouldn't be writing about that. If you're telling a teen that, if they're writing about, they're writing about other people, uh, adults are writing about other people, religious words, positive, the metaphysical, uh, friends, certainty. This is interesting. I want you to think, it, keep this in mind. They're using articles and prepositions in their posts, okay? Now look at words that are used by teens. They're talking about body state, school, sleeping. They're talking first person. So if you're having a conversation, you look, notice the difference? 
and what they're talking about. If you're having, if you're having a conversation with a teen, a, pre -twe a, a tween, an adolescent, early young adult, and they're doing this, but we are here going, well, let's talk about the meta. Why not post something religious or metaphysical? They don't care. This is what's important to their world. This is the relationships that they're building. Talk their language. The texties that I gave, talk the language. Now, remember on this one, we had articles and prepositions. Notice it's missing over here. What does that tell you? Adults are using full sentences. Kids are not. Their communication style is different. Okay, so there's the other argument. Well, they're not learning how to communicate. They're not learning how to write. Well, guess what? They're communicating with each other. Just because we're not communicating with them, does that mean that they're not communicating? No, they're not communicating in our style. And we need to be aware of that. There's also gender differences when you look at how people deal with social media. So men have task information, occupation, yes. They do, interesting, I thought this was, they do full body and environment pictures. Women will only do face shots, profiles, and friends. So when you're looking at this, these are things to kind of pay attention to. Okay, so real fast on this, I want to finish up. Um, there is an increase also in self-esteem when people are posting and they're getting likes. But they're only getting likes for certain things. When people post social processes, positive emotions, religious words and metaphysical thoughts, people tend to like more than when they're doing other things, when they're posting on other things. Now, if I'm working with my client, and she wants to talk about, okay, she's doing a, a social, if we're doing social process and I'm trying to get her that, it's like, okay, you did your puzzle. Who'd you do it with? Well, I had a friend come over. Perfect. That's a social process. Makes her feel good. And does it really matter when they said, you know, why, who cares? It, ca it matters to her. It matters to her. Interesting enough. Pay attention. This is the question you need to ask if they're hooked on social media. It depends on the time of day when a person is posting as to the type of post that they do and how they respond. So if you're early in the morning and you're posting, you're going to be more positive. If you're late at night, it's going to be more negative. Well, think about it. We're fresh in the morning. At night, we don't want to deal with it anymore. But that's going to make a difference in the type of interactions that you get with other people that goes back to your social media. You see, social media is not cut and dried. We have to use our brains. So when they say you don't use your brains, think about it, you do, because you have to go back logically all those steps to get to exactly where it is that you wanted to go in the first place. Um, just a little bit on looking at the words. People that are more popular and get more likes, these are the types of things that they're posting, as opposed to these that are not as important. Now, it's interesting because a lot of this over here, if you look, this part over here is a lot of the teen stuff. So they have, now we've got that social contagion again. We got people who are negative who are in that spot that are responding and, and saying, oh, that wasn't right, the Steubenville, the, any of those other cases, the, the, if you're anonymous, mo mo moving through that, you've got all of this that they're posting, yet these are the people that are more popular that are getting more self-esteem. So, because when we're looking at social media, it is not just one-dimensional and because we really need to pay attention that it is not just you know the older generation going well this is terrible but think about it didn't they do the same thing when cell phones came out didn't they do the same thing when uh, you know when television first came out uh, Socrates Socrates had issues when books were being when when writing when people had access you know why because he said our young people won't learn how to memorize and won't remember things so he had issues way back then. 
There's always going to be something that's coming up that's new and different that is going to change the way that we feel about things, the way we think about things, the way we perceive things. This is one of them. It just happens to be in our face all the time. But we need to look at it. We need to say, you know what? It needs to be dealt with. And then it needs to be embraced because it can be. So with that in mind, my last little bit video for you is a message from someone a little bit younger. Um, and I thought, it was, I thought it was pretty pertinent. So I'll let you we'll watch and see what, what um, this young lady has to say on social media. Roll camera two. Rolling. Action. Often we see social media as a waste of time. When we see young people on Facebook, Twitter or YouTube, we think they are wasting their time. We think they are wasting the precious time that youth is. He's always on Facebook. Update my He's profile always on Facebook. It's a great place He's to miss. Always However, there is good size to social media. Indeed, reports have shown that today's youth feels more united. Today's youth shows more curiosity and tolerance towards differences. Social media, Skype, internet, emails have enabled them to stay in touch with people from different countries and this had started a sense of curiosity for different countries and different cultures. So. Social media creates a sense of unity and diversity in our society. Through history, we learn that our differences have been the source of conflict and war, but today's youth show some tolerance towards differences, and that's let us hope of peace in our world. I think that what this young lady has said is important to remember is that it gives us a chance to reach out, to touch another person that we may not have. It can increase our tolerance. It can increase the way that we view life. And instead of doing the me thing of sitting and dragging my heels, kicking and screaming, maybe we just need to say, you know what? I don't have to do it, but I have to recognize it's a part of my life regardless. Yeah.